I, well, how many of you were in my class yesterday? There's a bunch of you, yeah. So some of this is gonna be very familiar, but hey, you get to see it again, and that's always good stuff. What I want to do is really talk about channels today, but what I don't want to do is same stuff. I want to give you some very practical ideas around how to think about channels. Uh, I, I think there's just not a lot of good information about how to really do that. And I want to give you some core mechanics. So these are going to be the base mechanics. You learn these channel mechanics with these ideas, and you're going to have a little bit more success using channels. But I have to be very, very clear here. I'm not a big fan of actor patterns and things like that. I like go routines to finish a complete job from beginning to end. I like scalability that way. When I see people throwing go routines and two go routines have to talk to each other and they're working almost on the same task, I start to get a little scared. Now, one of the most classic uses of throwing another go routine at the problem will be cancellation and deadlines and you really need to learn the context package. But I want to give you some basic mechanics around that. But I love these two things before we start, because I need you to start thinking differently than you have been. It's easy to adopt new technology, but hard to adopt new ways of thinking. And I love Tom Love's, uh, Tom Love is uh, one of the um, language designers for Objective-C. The software business is one of the very few places where we teach people how to write before they know how to read. Uh, yeah. Reading code is really important. You want to be a better writer of code, you got to be able to read code. And we're about to read code for the next 20 minutes. So let's go ahead and do this. Now I'm going to give you some very basic channel constructs that we have to wrap our head around. But if you've been in one of my classes, you know words mean things and I love words. And this is the word for today. Signaling. I do not want you thinking about channels without that word in mind. I know a channel is implemented like a queue, and we all want to think of it as a data structure. Stop. Stop thinking about channels as a data structure. It is not a data structure. It serves one purpose, the ability to signal to another Go routine about an event. And that signaling can happen in one of two ways. It can happen with data or without data. And the channel is going to give us these abilities. Now, there are two types of channels in Go, right? Unbuffered and buffered. If you watch any videos from anyone, a lot of people are just working with unbuffered channels. But I want to put some ideas around your head about one or the other. We're going to look at this. Let's think about that unbuffered channel for a second. What's happening there? Okay, signaling with data. Okay, here's the idea. And remember something as well. Everything's cost-benefit. There's Nothing's free. So, what is the benefit of an unbuffered channel? This is the benefit right here. We can signal with data with the guarantee that the signal has been received. The unbuffered channel gives us the benefit of a guaranteed knowledge that a signal has been received. What is the cost of that unknown latency? How does that work? Well, I always want you to focus that channel on the send side, on the send side. So I want to send this person right here. I always think of go routines to people. If you can't think of go routines to people, stop. You've got to have mental models and visualization. I want to send this person a signal. I need him to do something for me. So I come over here and I say, okay, uh, I'm going to send some data to him. I'm going to signal to him, but he's not here yet. He's never here. He's always late. I have no idea when he's going to come here. I now have unknown latency and I cannot move on. But I need to know he gets it because the last time I didn't know, shit didn't get done. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a pattern. <laughs> so I've got to wait here. Man, I'm waiting. Oh, hey, dude, you finally showed up, man. That's great. Boom, boom. We're together now. Now, how do I get the guarantee? The receive happens first. Dude, why did you let go of my hand? I know he let go of my hand. What do I now know? He's gone. There's a guarantee. That's the unbuffered channel. When you need a guarantee that the signal has been received. Ah, there it is. But what's the cost? Unknown latency. But don't we all want guarantees in life? If you don't, I got things to sell you right now. <laughs> We do. Guarantees give us predictability. It gives us consistency. It's good. But sometimes that latency is what? Going to hurt us. That's where the buffer channel comes in. What is the benefit of the buffer channel? Reducing latency. But what is the cost? No guarantee. Woo! And the larger the buffer, the worse the guarantee. So here's a general rule before we look at any patterns. I've got lots of things you can check off. Here's a rule. If you do not know 
How many go routines may attempt to send on a channel at any given time? You do not know. You are not allowed to use a buffer channel larger than one without giving me a call. <laughs> because anything larger than one is going to require a little data science, and now you've got to go reach out to Daniel. One, why do I say this? When you have no idea when there's going to be more sends, right, when sends can block, when a send can block on a channel, why am I telling you you're not allowed to go greater than one? Let's do the same exact example with my friend over here. I come over here, I want to give him a piece of data because I need him to do some work, like um, a letter, dude, I need you to deliver this letter. So I come over to him, but he's not there yet in typical fashion. So I put the letter down right here, and I turn around to get another piece of data. Now, when I turn around, two things are going to happen. If the data is missing, what do I know? You got it. Oh, look at that. I just signaled with data, and I had a guarantee that he what? He received it. I turned around, and it was gone. Man. I got a little reduced latency. I didn't get the guarantee right away, but I have it. But if I turn around and it's still there, what do I know? It's late again. Actually, what I really know is, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, something bad has happened to him. Something has happened, right? Something upstream is starting to go bad. And the last thing I want to do, if something upstream is going bad, is what? Put pressure on him and our system. The last thing I'm going to do is pull more data in. And then he's going back. I can't get this thing done. I'm not going to get anything else done. So why would I pull any more data in? Every time I pull a piece of data in, who's responsible for it? I mean, you know, you know he doesn't like responsibility. I don't either. But you see where that buffer of one is coming from. We're getting reduced latencies, but I still have a guarantee. Now, the only reason you're going to go larger than one in this scenario is because you've done a little measurement, and we know, I mean, we all really know him, He's really slow. I mean, the reality is he can never keep up. He gets distracted. He bets the horses. He's always losing. <laughs> so now I have to measure maybe a little bit. Maybe the buffer can be two or three to compensate for how slow he is. Come on, now, son. <laughs> so this is what I want you to be thinking about. We are using channels to signal other go routines to do things. Either we want the guarantee, what is the cost? Unknown latency. Or we want to try to reduce some of that latency, but if we do, what is the cost? We walk away from the guarantee. Now there are times, like in a fan out pattern, where we can have a buffer channel that's larger. We know exactly how many go routines we're waiting on. We know how many sends. No sends should block. That's fine, everything's measurable, no magic numbers. And there are patterns I'll show you where you have a situation where you say, okay, look, I'm gonna keep taking this work in, we're gonna feed it. But at some point, we're gonna be at load, we're gonna be at capacity. And once we're at capacity, what are we gonna do? Drop, drop, drop data. Now we can have a buffer that's larger, but we have to measure that. Think about this scenario, I always love this scenario. Let's say you were writing a DNS server. Right? I mean, if you're writing a DNS server, you're probably pretty good. Like, nobody's going to attack you. <laughs> Ever. We're cool. Okay, so somebody's starting to attack you, right? You have to make a decision. You have to know how many concurrent requests can we handle at any given time before life starts getting bad. So let's say, magic number, uh, 100,000, we can handle 100,000 transactions in our server, max, that's it, bump. Once 100,001 come in, what do we have to do? Drop it. So how do we do that? Here's the case where we can have that buffer channel. We can set it to that size. Then things are coming in. We get it into the buffer. What does that mean? Good. Good. But as soon as we can't send that into the buffer, what does that mean? Life's bad. Drop, drop, drop. But again, anytime I see a buffer that's larger than one, you better have a little data science behind it. There's no guessing. There's no magic numbers. Everybody in my classes know how much I like to take walks. That's why I'm so you know, thin, because I walk a lot. If I see something I don't like because you're not thinking about design, you're not thinking about the impacts, we're going to take a walk. Now, let's go ahead and start looking at our basic mechanics. I'm telling you right now, if you learn these six or seven, I don't remember how many they are, basic patterns, you can apply these ideas in even more complex ways. And again, the context package is going to be uh, your friend here. So let's look at this. Let's see if we can visualize this. I want you to look at GoRoutines as people, 
bring this stuff into the real world. Mental models. What is this code doing right here? We're creating an unbuffer channel. What does that mean? We want what? The guarantee for what? Unknown latency, but the guarantees are good. There we go. Now, think of me always as this main goer team creating the channel. So, I've created the channel, and I've gone over here and I said, all right, do it. you go here, you're there, okay. Um, let me know, I'm gonna wait for you, right? I'm gonna wait for you, you go off, I create them. I'm gonna wait for you, there's the channel receive. You guys have all seen channels before, right? Channel receive is a unary operation. That I was on the left. I am now waiting. Unbuffered. Guarantees. I'm waiting for him to come in and say, send me a signal. Hey, dude, can you send me a Come on, man, send me a signal. Yes. Now he comes over here and he performs his signal. Hey, hello. But I'm waiting. It's unbuffered. What does this mean? I get the guarantee. How does he know? Think about it on the sender side. How does he know that I received the signal? Because the receive happens first. So I get that signal, I move on, he's notified, hey, it's gone, he moves on. Very basic, basic pattern here. But I need you to start visualizing this. The send, the receive, on the sender side, the guarantee. Okay, it's a little more complex. Somebody's got to tell me when I've got like no time left here. God, you believe that's that 15 minutes already went by? So now, I told you that you can have signals with data and without data. Here's the signaling without data. What do we do? Unbuffer channel. There we go. I launch the door team. Hey, go off and do some work and let me know when you're done. How are they going to let us know we're done? We're going to signal without data. That is the close. A close is a state change. That channel's in an open state and then it's in a closed state. How does that work? If you receive on a channel and there's data, brilliant, we're going to get it back. If you receive on a channel and it's closed, it's also going to return. And what we have here is the ability to identify that stuff. We're doing things very simply right now. But a data value can come out of the channel or OK can be false, in which case B will always be zero value. So this is what we're doing here. Now, I'm not storing this data because I know the only way I would receive on this channel is if it has been what? Close. We're signaling without data. So what happens here? I go off and I say, dude, go off and do some work for me. I'm going to wait right here. Boom. The signal happens without data on the close on line 44. I get to move on. You move on. Life is good. Signaling without data on the state change. These are all things that we can do. Let's get a little more complex here. Maybe. Maybe it's not enough to know that the signal was received. I need to know when that work is done. Here we go. How does that work? Okay, good. Unbuffer channel. Hey, go off and you wait for me. Hey, hey, you wait for me. There's a receive. You, I get you over there. Wait for me. I'm going to be right back. Now, what do I do? I come over here. I send a signal with data. He's waiting. He receives that signal. And now I wait. I want to know they're done. I'm now waiting for another signal with data. That work gets done, signal happens, we're both good, again, the guarantee. I need you to start visualizing this stuff with go teams being people. I need you to start visualizing the idea of signaling. I don't want you using this as a data structure. I want you to use it as a mechanism for signaling with data and without data. We've got two go teams in play, they need to know about what's going on, we've got a signal here, what is the mechanism that we need? Now, I don't have a lot of time here. So, I'm going to move on to this right here. Okay, look, this is a basic cancellation timeout. Now, you should be using the context package, but the mechanics are basically the same. This time, I'm using a buffer channel of one. I'm willing to reduce the guarantee, but just down to one, which means I'm going to have some guarantee that on December is going to be pretty close. So what do I do? I go and I launch that go routine, and I tell that go routine, go off and do some work, and you bring me back the result. You tell me when we're done. Go off, and now I'm waiting. But here's the select case. Look at this. I'm in a select case. In case one, what am I doing? I'm waiting and praying and hoping that finally he gets his act together and he's fast enough. But I've learned my lesson. If he's not fast enough, if he doesn't come back within 100 milliseconds, times out after he turns a channel that I can wait on, and I'm going to get that time value and that duration. If he doesn't finish his work in 100 milliseconds, what am I doing? Moving on. I'm moving on. Mm -hmm. Look, if you're writing 
in current software, there's three things you have to be doing. Three things, three major things. Your software has to be able to start up and shut down cleanly. If you can't, you cannot open, you cannot update your production software. You can't be calling kill nine every time you want to replace your server. Two, you have to monitor and manage your back pressure. You have to know where that back pressure is. That is the health of your system. But to reduce back pressure, you need timeout. You need to be able to do rate limiting. You need these things in your server. Nothing can take forever. So, you got 100 milliseconds to make this happen, son. If not, I'm moving on. Why is the buffer channel one? Why are we using one? What happens if this is unbuffered? Read the code, follow it. Think of this as people. I move on 100 milliseconds later. That work finally gets done. That person goes to send a signal with data, and is there anybody there? I'm using an unbuffer channel. He wanted to guarantee. You ain't getting a guarantee, you get nothing. There's nobody there to receive it. So where is this buffer of one helping us? We don't leak a go routine. Now, I don't care who you are. You're going to leak a go routine in your lifetime. When it happens, you are not allowed to get upset at yourself. You are to laugh, go to the bar, and have a drink on me. <laughs> Just one a week, please. <laughs> this will happen. I don't care how long you've been writing multi-threaded software. This stuff is complicated. It's going to happen. What you need are mental models, visualizations in your head. And I'm going to close this talk so I don't have any other time left to say this. If you're working in a debugger day in and day out, delete it from your machine. No more debuggers. They are death. They are evil. What they do is prevent you from maintaining a mental model of that software. All you're doing is looking at symptoms, fixing little things, and you're not really architecting designing that software for today. You guys all know one of my favorite quotes. All software projects fall into two categories. What are they? Those that fail, and those that become legacy horrors. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>